Usually we deal with a flow to equity, that is the cash flow to equity. And um, this leads to valuation techniques. And uh, this is a, I, um, we're the only, uh, we're not dealing with the, uh, the uh, cash flow to lenders. Um, it's, uh, there is an interest payment. This is actually for a perpetual project. We're not doing any principal payments um, uh, because it's a perpetual company or project. But uh, so we've left that out. Uh, this is just the same as a slide that was shown yesterday. Uh, there's no depreciation because you never uh, you you, uh, you you keep uh, renewing the equipment every year. It's a highly idealized model, as you can see. Um, a flow to equity project valuation um, got perpetual net income taxed at a rate tau, um, paying interest uh, R sub D uh, times D on a perpetual loan D. Um, the cash available to the equity holders is x minus i times 1 minus tau. The value of the levered equity is uh, this uh, equation here. The net present value of a project costing k to build is just uh, uh, this equation shown here. We've, we've, uh, this, is the, this is the amount available. This minus k plus d is the amount that the equity holders um, um, actually pay out of their pockets. Uh, to uh, to the project, uh, the lenders contribute the K is the total capital cost, and in the end there'll be a uh, this amount of cash available to the equity holders. Um, the other valuation technique is the weighted average cost of capital technique, and if we rearrange the equation for the cash available to the equity holders, divide by the project value, uh, the return to assets uh, the it's given by the weighted average cost of capital. So this part here is, we just divided this all out and uh, separated things. This first part here is the return to equity, and the second part is the after-tax return to debt. So the net present value of a project costing K to build is this here. Uh, X times 1 minus tau divided by RW minus the total capital cost. There's yet another technique called the adjusted present value, and um, it starts off with a base case, the value of the asset if it's financed entirely by equity, and then you add on these financing effects, and so there's a variety of them. There could be interest tax shields. That's the one we're most interested in, but there could be bankruptcy costs, subsidies. Uh, that was of interest actually in... Uh, when I was in Nigeria, the possibility of a subsidy from the government to this barium sulfate or barite project, and there were also interest tax shields. Um, there may be shared debt issue costs and other costs, so such as leases. Um, you start off with this and add on these financing effects. So the adjusted present value of the project costing K to build and having only an interest rate tax shield, D tau, is as shown here. It's just the cash available to equity holders of an all-equity operation divided by the uh, R0, if you can determine what that is, uh, minus the capital cost of the project plus the interest rate tax yield. Incidentally, one way of getting R0, if I could go back a couple of slides, um, This slide here. If you knew what RE was uh, from, say, the capital asset price or observations, um, and you know the debt over equity ratio is of a particular op company or operation, you can, and you know what their interest loan rate on their loans is, you can unravel all this to get R an R0, but it is an estimate of R0. Um, as I said, you know, R0 and RB are the only ones that are. Uh, Fundamental. The rest are all derivations of derivatives of the others. So how does so those are the three valuation techniques and actually on a hidden slide which I yes number twenty one uh, which isn't shown here um, but it might be a, a, a bit visible to you um, it shows some numbers you can plug into these equations and all these answers all these different techniques the adjusted present value 
the weighted average cost of capital and the float equity give the same answer for the numbers shown actually for any numbers that you any numbers that you put into it uh, that's for a, a perpetual project or a perpetual um, company and uh, things change when there's a finite life project with principal payments and the reason for that we'll get into in a minute so let's just look at how an equity financing might work um, Let's look at this company called MinProCo. Uh, it's a mineral processing, mining and mineral processing company, and it wants to finance a new plant. It has 50 million shares outstanding. The annual after-tax cash flow from existing operations is $60 million. The cost of equity capital is 10%, and we assume a perpetual cash flow. It's an ongoing operation, such as that at Trail in BC or some uh, one of um, uh, some companies' um, processing plant. Uh, the market value of all that is $60 million divided by 0.1, uh, which is $600 million. The price per share would then be $12. So we start with that. And then we say that the, the cost of the new plant is $40 million. Um, this could be an add-on to a plant, perhaps. But anyway, the after-tax cash flow uh, is uh, of this add-on or the new plant is $6.5 million. Uh, the net present value of all that would be $25 million. So you announce this new plant and issue shares, and announce the fact that you're going to issue shares. So you have this new plant as an intangible asset shown here. The total assets are now $625 million, and the change in equity uh, should be $25 million, assuming the market responds to this favorably. The new share price will be $12.50. So we assume that the market uh, works, that, that everyone believes the story, and um, then we're, we'll get this new share price. Uh, now you issue 3.2 million shares. That's 40 million over 12.50. Uh, you now have to issue um, fewer shares because your share price is up. Um, and you get $40 million cash. Uh, now you have another asset called cash. Uh, you hold on to that for a while until you find a contractor to build the plant. Um, you have now have 53.2 million shares outstanding, and uh, the share price remains the same. You spend the 40 million to get the new asset worth 65 million, and now you have existing operations uh, of 665 million dollars. Those are your new assets. And your shareholder equity is 665 million, um, and everything balances. So. Very straightforward um, and highly idealized, of course, but that's basically how it works. You announce the new plant, the, the intention to um, issue shares, and uh, the market responds. You issue the shares, then take the cash and build the plant. When it comes to debt, um, you uh, say you want to. Um, finance this entire thing but with debt this would be unusual but let's just the same for the sake of argument let's say we're going to try and finance this all by debt um, so now we have this new plant that's worth 25 million um, and we have a new share price of twelve dollars and fifty cents we say we're going to issue the debt uh, say issue some bonds we receive the 40 million dollars in cash but now we've got uh, another liability there of 40 million dollars uh, the shareholder equity um, goes up to 625, and so everything uh, still balances. The equity is the same, so the share price is the same. You just got this additional liability. Um, you spend the 40 million to get the new asset worth 65 million dollars. The interest rate is six uh, percent. The tax shield would be the debt times the uh, um, tax rate. It's 35 percent, let's say. Uh, that's $14 million, and uh, so now you've got a tax shield, which is a, a, an asset. The uh, total assets are now $679 million. The debt is $40 million. Uh, the shareholder equity is $639 million, um, which is uh, the 625 plus 14, and uh, the total liabilities and equity are the same. The new share price is now $12.78. So there is a bit of a leverage, a return to equity uh, caused by issuing debt. Um, and uh, so you'll get a slightly higher uh, return to equity as a result of issuing debt. 
there's no change in value. It's just um, it's, 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 as far as the shareholders are concerned, they're getting the added advantage of this tax shield. 